Okay, so today we are in Love and Torah Part 7. Part 7. Love and Torah Part 7. You want me to sing it? What's love got to do? Got to... All right. All right, so we've been trying to understand what love has to do with it. And, you know, we've been going through this now for a couple of parts. I don't know how many more parts this is going to go. We haven't even gotten to some of the things I really want to cover with loving your neighbor as yourself, et cetera. So we're probably not even halfway done here, which I'm sure is fine with all of you. Well, let's just kind of recap where we're at here. So we have the two great commands. One is to love Elohim, and the other is to love your neighbor. We're told that we are to do these things with all our heart, with all our might and being. And so this is what all of the other instructions are about. Okay, we are to take the instructions that he gives us in the two categories, loving him, and there's lots of instructions on how to love him, things he expects us to do that he receives as us expressing love towards him. And then how we love each other, which we're not getting to at this point, but we're going to be getting to in a future part of the teaching. And, of course, it's going to seem a little redundant for those of you that are also following along in the weekly Torah portions because we, as in last week, we're in chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. This week we're in chapter 7, and we're still covering some of the verses that were covered in the Torah portion. So we're right on schedule with that. Okay, so that kind of works into both categories. Now, and so we've been looking at and trying to understand and see that where love is talked about in Scripture, when Yahweh is talking about love, when Yeshua is talking about love, when anybody is talking about love, it almost every single place, in almost every single case, it is connected to Torah observance in some way. Now, even when it's not the word commandments or law or right rulings or something connected to it, it will talk about righteousness. Okay, and righteousness is what? Something you do called Torah observance. When you do what he says, it is called righteousness. Doing what's right. It's a very simple definition. And we've, we talked about that. We even read a verse with the definition. Okay? That is righteousness when we do what he says. Okay. So now let's take that, and we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. And I'm going to begin in verse 1, even though it really doesn't kick into what my point needs to be until about verse 6. But I want to make sure we have what's the most important thing we've been talking about for years now? Context. Context. So context is what makes it possible for you to understand what you're reading. It also makes it less likely for you to misunderstand because you can misinterpret or misunderstand something when you have it out of context, okay? So, since what I want to get to is more in the range of verses 6 through 14, but let's start in verse 1 to get some of the context. We're in chapter 7 of Devarim, Deuteronomy. When Yahweh your Elohim brings you into the land which you go to possess, okay, here's your context. He's saying, this stuff is something you need to know, understand, and be prepared for when you go into the land to possess. And where are they right now listening to this speech, this sermon? They're right there about to do this. So Moses wants to make sure that they were prepared physically, mentally, emotionally, most important, spiritually, for what was going to happen here in the you know, very near future. They're ready to go. They're right there across the Jordan, ready to go into the land. He says, when Yahweh your Elohim brings you into the land which you go to possess, he shall also clear away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Ebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when Yahweh your Elohim gives them over to you, you shall smite them and put them under the ban completely. Make no covenant with them and show them no favor. Now, I'm not focusing on that part. The main part is, listen to what he says, he shall also clear away the nations before you. But notice that him clearing them away still required them to do something. This is an important connection. Because if you're coming out of mainstream Christianity, if you're coming out of that church mindset, you've been taught that he does everything, you don't have to do anything. So here he starts out by saying, he shall also clear away many nations before you. And then verse 2 tells you, by you smiting them and putting them under the ban completely. So you have your part. Now he's going to allow that you should have no trouble doing that. He says that when you're in covenant, you don't have to worry about anything. We've seen battles where 
all of the other side ends up dead and none of the Israelites end up dead. That's an incredible battle. But they still had to fight and still had to do what had to be done. So he says, in the context leading up to where we're going, he says, understand that you have your role. And he says, look, on your side of it, you are trusting him, but you're doing, in the word there that he foc- I want you to focus on is completely. You're doing what he said completely. Now we see that a certain king named Shaul had a problem with this. Because he did not, when it was his time to do this, do it completely. And we heard crying and weeping and bleeding of sheep, so to speak. And this was a problem that Samuel had to come and say, excuse me, what is going on? This is not what's supposed to be going on. And so here the instruction is, yes, you're going to go into the land to possess. Yes, he's going to clear away the nations. But yes, you're going to do your part. And then he continues. And by the way, he says, make no covenant with them and show them no favor. Why, why would he say make no covenant with them? Because they made a covenant already. You can't have two covenants. They made a covenant at Sinai with Yahweh. That's it. And then he says, show them no favor. Why do you show them no favor? Maybe not for the reason you're thinking. Because favor is not yours to give. This is an issue between them and him. You see, understand what I'm saying now. When you're in charge of something and something is your responsibility, you can choose to give favor or not. So you can show favor to a spouse. You can show favor to a child. You can show favor to an employee. You can show, those that are under your responsibility, you have a contract with and a responsibility with. This was about the, the seven nations and their relationship to Yahweh, and Yahweh was allowing Israel to be an instrument in his hand for whatever reason to bring his judgment. And he says, you don't intervene or interfere with my judgment. So don't show them any favor. Not because you may think they deserve it or not, because you don't know everything about the relationship they had with Yahweh and why he had decided to wipe them out. And so this is a very important thing. Because you may decide, and this happens, believe it, it happens, that you will break a Torah instruction because of your covenant with Yahweh, right? You have a Torah instruction. You'll break that covenant because you think you're being merciful or showing compassion or you're trying to do something that is incorrect. It's a wrong relationship. But my mother wants me to do this. But my brother or sister wants me to do that. Or if I don't show up at this wedding or funeral and you're thinking the loving thing to do would be to go. Well, you have a covenant that says no. Every year, we have empty seats. Not this year so much, because this year nobody graduated from anything. Well, they graduated, but without a ceremony. But every year when there was graduation ceremonies, we'd have a few empty seats, because people weren't here, because they went to a graduation. Or this is the time of year also where they'll be going to a wedding. Or you never know when, you know, sadly, a funeral comes up. What favor are you trying to show somebody at the expense of the covenant you have with him? Remember, when he's giving these instructions, Deuteronomy 7, and he says, you will go and smite them and put them under the ban completely, that falls under the covenant that says, when I say it, you do it. No questions, period. That includes the weddings, the funerals, the graduations, and anything else that might come up that you might try to figure out a way to try to justify and spin, even though he said it's Shabbat, it's not time for those things. Shabbat's about your relationship in the vertical. It's all about, read Isaiah 58, the last couple of verses. I know people like to argue that's about Yom Kippur. It's about Sabbath mindset. That you focus not on your pleasures, but on his. Not on your words, but but his. Not on the things about you, but the things about him. It's about the above, not the below. Okay? So now he's telling them, when you go into the land, I'm expecting you to do certain things. And there's going to be a lot of that in Deuteronomy before they actually go over, where he explains things he expects them to do when they're there. Once they've gone in there, he expects certain things. And he wants to make sure nobody can say, well, we didn't know. 
Well, I've told you over and over. Matter of fact, there's almost nothing in Deuteronomy that he didn't already say. Deuteronomy's kind of a summary contract. It's like taking the other stuff that went on from Sinai and all the other history of it and turning it into a legal document. There are those that have done research to say that actually the, the wording and the format of Deuteronomy is very much like a legal document from the ancient Near East times. And so he's laying out very clearly, this is my expectation. But he also says what you can expect from me. We expect, as Israelites, he's saying, look, you can expect that I'm going to clear away the nations. You're not going to have a problem, but you're going to have to do the physical work. I'm not going to just wave my hand and just blow them into the sea. You're going to have to go in there and show your obedience. And then we get context-wise to verse 3. He says, and look, don't intermarry with them. Don't give your daughter to his son, and you do not take his daughter to your son. Because some may think, oh, well, maybe I can avoid this putting under the ban thing by intermarrying with them. And then, of course, then they're not that whole thing anymore. It's sort of a mixed mess. He's saying, oh, no, don't do that. Because he turns your sons away from following me to serve other mighty ones. He says, don't you do that. Don't take their daughters or take their sons because the spouse may try to lead the Israelite over into paganism. That's a big challenge. Okay, so remember, this intermarrying, again, as we've talked about in other places, has nothing to do with race. Let's be really careful with that. I think I said that on Tuesday, just to make sure. Okay, this is not a racial thing. This is not a racist thing. This is a covenantal thing. Remember, it was a mixed multitude that came out of Egypt. It never says how mixed or how unmixed that was. Let's just assume it was as mixed as mixed can be. All kinds of different peoples of different backgrounds and different whatever, all in this group. But then they became one people by covenant, by choice. And he's saying, don't bring others into this covenant that are going to pull you out. And that's the problem. It's their beliefs, not their skin color. Okay? Their beliefs and their approach towards their creator, not their skin color, that's the problem. Not the place or country, even if it wasn't skin color, not the country that they came from. Doesn't matter their background. Doesn't even matter that it was pagan before. If they've covenanted, now they're covenanted. But he's saying these people that are of these seven nations, don't intermarry with them. Because the problem is explained very clearly because they are likely to turn away your daughters and your sons from following me to serve only other mighty ones. And then the displeasure of Yahweh shall burn against you and promptly destroy you. Isn't this what happened at Baal Peor? Is this what we saw happen with the, the daughters of the Moabites coming in? And they were intermarrying and they were doing all kinds of other things. And then we needed our hero Pinchas to step up and put an end to the craziness. He says, verse 5, but this is what you do to them. Break down their altars, smash their pillars, cut down their asherim, and burn their carved images with fire. Okay, and by the way, use verse 5 as a part of the evidence and part of the guidance is what you do with all your old Christmas stuff. When you come into this and you think, oh, but you have no idea how much money I spent on that stuff and blah, blah, blah. Or that was given to me by my grandmother, blah, blah, blah. Or that was a family heirloom, blah, blah, blah. This is what you do to them. Break them, burn them, destroy them. Period. There's other verses that talk about you should not try to, to, to keep like the silver or the gold that may have been on them. In other words, selling them so you can put money in your pocket to try to redeem what you feel like you lost. If you had kept that stuff and never changed your beliefs, it would never put any more money back in your pocket. Why all of a sudden do you want money back in your pocket? You were never planning to sell that stuff ever. You were planning to use it every year until it wore out, broke, or you passed it down to somebody else. So why all of a sudden do you want to sell it? Why do you, because you have an emotional attachment. You got to break down that emotional attachment. 
He says, all of this is now leading into verse 6. So I wanted to give us the context. He says, when Yahweh brings you into the land and he clears away all these nations and you do what you need to do and you're not intermarrying and you're dealing with all of their ritualistic pagan stuff that's going on there, he says, you need to understand the reason you do all these things is because, verse 6, because you are a set-apart people to Yahweh your Elohim. See, I could have just started off at verse 6. For you are a set-apart people. But you needed to have the context, what he's talking about. You're about to go into a place where you're going to pass through and deal with people doing all kinds of things that you're going to observe and think, oh, that looks like fun. Oh, that looks pretty cool. Maybe we should do that to Yahweh. That looks like a way to go. And you'll start imitating that which is inappropriate. He says, oh, no, no. You are a set-apart people to Yahweh your Elohim. Yahweh your Elohim has chosen you to be a people for himself. For himself. Not to be shared with anybody else. He says, a treasured possession above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Yahweh, now, so he's giving, he's now again, the context that leads into the next verse is like, look, he's doing these things because in his mind, in his heart, this is what's his plan, is to have a people, a treasured possession above all the other nations. And by the way, he's gonna then humble them a little bit here in a minute to say, you weren't there so that you could walk around and strut and walk around all full of yourself, but you were to be the envy of the nations and saying, I want what they have and you were supposed to be able to say, I can show you how you can have it. Instead of saying, well, isn't it great to be me? And I'm sorry, you don't get to be us. We're special. Okay, this is not so that you could walk around all full of yourself and thinking how special you are. But he's telling you you were special for a purpose. To be the light that others would say, whatever you have, how can I have it too? And then we were there to show them the way. He says, now keep this context now. He just said all of that and pumped him up. And now listen to verse 7. Yahweh did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were so many of you, more numerous than any other people. For you are the least of all the peoples. He says, don't, don't start thinking that somehow you're so awesome just because of anything to do with you. You're awesome, only awesome because Yahweh chose you. And you're only awesome because you're willing to covenant with him. Not because of any other specialness about you uniquely. He says, but because of Yahweh loving you and because of him guarding the oath which he swore to your fathers, Yahweh has brought you out with a strong hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, sovereign of Mitzrayim. So this he's now telling you, this is where the word love is coming into this. Okay? He's saying, look, he didn't set his love on you because of anything other than the fact that he has chosen and he loves you even though you're least of the people, even though you don't deserve anything. He said, but he loves you. And he also has a promise that he's made to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. An oath. And he's guarding the oath which he swore. And that's why he has set you apart. And he said that he's done all of this, so verse 9, so that you shall know that Yahweh your Elohim, he is Elohim. Remember, you're dealing with the time period unlike we have today. We don't have this today as much as they had it back then. Where there was every nation had pagan gods, multiple, hundreds of them, thousands of them, whatever. And so there was lots of arguing and fighting over if anybody even cared which one was actually true or not. And really most people didn't care. They worshiped whatever they worshiped. But he's saying you're going to now know. You're going to have a relationship and knowing that Yahweh, your Elohim, he is Elohim. He's real. And you're going to know that. You're going to have a relationship that allows you to know that he is Elohim, the trustworthy El, guarding the covenant and kindness for a thousand generations with those who love him and those who guard his commands. See the linkage again? He chose you because he loved you, knowing what? That you would covenant and guard his commands. That's the nature of the love relationship. He says, and you shall know. That's the whole context. Well, he's going to bring you into the land. He's going to clear out the nations. You're going to do your part. You're not going to intermarry and, and dilute and pollute what he's given you to do, which could jeopardize the covenantal relationship because you may be drawn away. 
Yahweh says, you're going to have me and nobody else. Don't want to be shared. Don't want to be a part of a you know, pantheon of whatever. I am Yahweh. I am Elohim. I am your Elohim. And he says, if you understand that, he says, then you're going to understand that he redeemed you from the house of bondage. And I think that all of this is always a metaphor for today, whatever bondage you were in. Because you are not, you are not physically these people. These people were at the Jordan ready to cross into the land and they're long dead. This is thousands of years ago. You, on the other hand, are doing the same thing that they were doing. You are covenanting with the Elohim, and he has called you out of your bondage, your Mitzrayim, your Egypt. You've all had that testimony. You all have that experience. So this is for you, because all of you are looking to do what? Go in and possess. And what are you looking to possess? Same thing they were. The land, the kingdom. But you're looking to possess it in the forever context. And just like they went in in a physical way, and there was a time period that was leading into that, we have a millennium that comes before the forever kingdom. And that's when we will return to the land. And he says here, he says, you shall know that Yahweh Elohim, he is Elohim, the trustworthy El guarding covenant and kindness for a thousand generations with those who love him. And how do you express that? He says, by being those who guard his commands. If you love me, you'll guard my commands. This is everywhere. This is everywhere. Now he does tell us in verse 10, but bear in mind, he does repay those who hate him to their face to destroy them. He does not delay to do so with him who hates him. He repays him face to face. So if he says that guarding the commands expresses love, how do you think we express hate? By breaking commands. Worse, by doing what, you know, Matthew, Yeshua tells us, the least of those who teach people to break commands. It's bad enough to break them, but when you start teaching people to break them, that's even worse. So he says here, don't, don't think for a second that in your breaking them that you're going to get away with anything. You may for a while in the, in the below, in the physical world, but in the ultimate, how it plays out ultimately, there's no getting away with anything. You know, it says, you know, in the Brit, Yahweh is not mocked, Elohim is not mocked, you will reap what you sow. Otherwise, he's mocked, and he is not going to be mocked. And he says, and you shall guard the command and the laws and the right rulings which I command you today to do them. This is again expression of, oh, that was for them, those Israelites, they were hard-headed and we're so much smarter than them and they needed those laws and all that stuff. There's no change anywhere in here. He says, I am Yahweh, I change not. Messiah is referred to as the same yesterday, today, and forever. If they were changing, then we could rely on nothing. All of this is a wasted exercise because they could just change it. But you see, notice that he says that before expecting us, he says that he is guarding the covenant. Verse 9, he says, the trustworthy L guarding covenant. He's keeping his side, you can rely on it. And guarding promises through the generations. He has made lots of promises in this book that we read called the Scriptures. Okay, all through the Tanakh, all through the Brich Hadashah, he's made lots of promises. And you can absolutely count on him doing his part of it. And you can also count on you receiving exactly what he said you would, whether good or bad whether being repaid to your face or whether receiving the kindness and love through a thousand generations. And guess what? It's what you do that determines it. I know that's still swimming upstream for some of the newer people against what you were taught in the church. The rest of you, you're like, amen, amen, I get it. 
Okay, and that's good. You need to keep hearing it and keep hearing it and keep hearing it. Okay, it's what you do. That's why the teaching that was so important, making decisions, the reason you exist, because you make a decision about what? About what you do. Your decision is to decide to do or not do something. And so why, that's why making decisions is the most important part of your life. Because you're going to make a choice. Choose today. You know, you, you know Yehoshua says, as for me in my house, I choose to do what Yahweh says. Well, he says, I choose Yahweh. But when he says that, what does he mean? He means, I choose to keep my covenant. I choose to guard his commands. I choose to do what he says. So when a family mender, a family mender, I wish they were menders. It would fix a lot of things. Okay? When a family member or friend or coworker or somebody tries to lure you into doing something that go, would go against the command, you have to say, I'm sorry, but I choose Yahweh. And your family member is not going to be happy when you choose your belief in your creator over them. Oh, you mean you choose your, you know, that church over, because I'll call this a church, because they don't know anything about, you know, the difference between, because church really evokes a very specific mindset. Okay, so that's why we choose to call it a congregation, assembly, whatever. Not that church is a wrong word, it's just that it's already been Christianized, if you know what I'm saying. It means very specific things to people. And so they will get mad at you that you're choosing this group, is what they're going to say, over them. And you're like, no, I'm choosing him over you, and that's scriptural. And if you're a believer in scripture, and you're a believer in Messiah, whether it's Christianity or whatever... All right, you can clap for that one. If they claim to be Christians, you should look at them and say, and you should too. You should be choosing him over me and him over your husband, your wife, and your children, or whatever. That's scriptural. So why are you surprised that I'm choosing him over you? Don't be offended. Be proud of me. <laughs> Stop letting your little baby feelings get hurt and be proud of me. And if it's your mother, say, didn't you raise me this way? I know you raised me to do Christmas and Easter and everything else, but didn't you raise me to love him more than everything? Well, stop complaining then when I'm doing it. You just don't like the way I'm doing it. You don't like my interpretation of what he wants. My understanding about what he wants. I'm just doing Philippians 2. And you guys should all remember that verse. I quote it all the time, right? Philippians 2, 12. You're walking out your own salvation. And they'll know that verse, even if you don't tell them the number of it, but they'll know. You know the verse that says, walking out your own salvation, fear and trembling? That's all I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm not trying to mock you. I'm not trying to hurt you, do anything. I'm just trying to put him first. And walk that out. And so here he's saying, look, this understanding, you can go dispensational and claim that it's only for them. You could try to believe that Yeshua is now somehow changing everything. Of course, that would break everything scriptural. And believe that somehow his commands are different than what we're reading here. It doesn't matter that Yeshua himself said, everything I say comes from the Father, Everything I do, so when he says, if you love me, guard my commands, he might as well have said, if you love me, guard the Father's commands. So that takes that whole argument out of the mix. Because people say, well, I just have to do the red letter stuff. No, let's go to Yeshua's own words. I only say what the Father tells me to say. Therefore, if you believe that the Old Testament was the Father speaking and the New was the Son speaking, no, they're both the Father speaking because the Son said, I'm only saying what my Father told me to say. I'm not saying the son is the father. I'm simply saying is his words are the father's words. He said so himself. So then there's still no contradiction. Everything I say, he told me to say. And everything I do is what he told me to do. So if you don't believe me, believe the father, believe the one who sent me. Because it's his works that I do. And so here we are back in chapter 7. He says, And you shall guard the command and the laws and the right rulings which I command you today to do them. 
And it shall be, verse 12, because you hear these right rulings and shall guard and do them, that Yahweh your Elohim shall guard with you the covenant and the kindness which he swore to your fathers. There's a relationship, if, then. All relationships have that. If, then. He said, and if you will do these things, it shall be when, you, now listen, because you shema, before, because you hear and do the right rulings and guard and do them, then Yahweh will guard the covenant with you. Now what happened when they kept breaking it and breaking it and breaking it? Yahweh said, no, fine, I'm done with the covenant for right now. Covenant, you broke it. Remember, it's the covenant which they broke. We have verses to talk about, and I will renew a covenant with them, not like the covenant which they broke. That's Jeremiah 31. Not like the one which they broke. He didn't break anything. You're not going to listen? Fine, I'm scattering you. And Moses tells them that's what's going to happen. He says, and actually we'll probably, we can go right all the way over to that part too, because it wasn't part of my notes, but we can just continue. It's in chapter 7. And so we can get to that. He says, oh, Okay. He's going to deliver you out there to do these things. Now, let's continue. He says, but because you hear and because you guard and do, Yahweh your Elohim will guard the covenant with you and the kindness which he swore to your fathers and shall love you. Oh, there it is again. Because you're doing commandments, he shall love you. But I don't think we need to earn his love. What relationship have you ever noticed where anybody didn't earn love in some way? You earn respect. You earn love. He says, and, you shall and he shall love you and bless you and increase you and shall bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land, your grain and your new wine and your oil the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flock in the land which he swore to your fathers to give you. Blessed are you above all peoples. There's not going to be a barren man or woman or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So he's going on now to the blessings. He's giving you the blessings that he's telling you are going to happen. What have I said over and over and over again about blessings and cursings? I've said that Torah does a few things. What's it do? It keeps you safe. But first and foremost, it blesses you, right? Bless, we have it on our shirts, right? Our MTI shirts on the back. It says, blesses you, keeps you safe, and transforms you into the image of the sun. So he says, if you keep the covenant, guard the commands, do these things, it says, he shall love you and bless you. Let me just turn to something real quickly here. In the beginning of chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, we call it the blessings and cursings chapter. It says, and it shall be if you diligently obey the voice of Yahweh your Elohim to guard, to do all his commands, which I command you today that Yahweh your Elohim set, has set you, excuse me, he shall set you high above all the nations. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey. Not just anything, if you obey the voice of Yahweh, which is the Exodus 19 covenant. If you agree and do everything that comes out of my mouth and obey my voice, I will give all these things. So I don't know how anybody would say that the Torah is a bad thing. It's connected to all the blessings. All blessings you read about in Scripture are connected to obedience to Torah. He says, all these blessings shall come upon you if you diligently obey the voice of Yahweh. So relationally, that's his expression of love. Do, don't you want to bless people when you love them? When they've done something that's pleasing in your sight, when they've earned favor in your sight, don't you want to do something nice for them? Don't you look for ways to do things for them nice? To bless them? To express your heart towards them? Now, on the other side of it, when they're not listening, this happens a lot with parents or children or spouses, Right? When they're not listening and they're not paying attention and they're not showing that respect, etc., you're not thinking of anything to do nice. Matter of fact, you've got a whole bunch of curses you'd like to have fall on them. Well, Yahweh's no different. Not from an emotional standpoint. That's the function of relationship. 
I want to bless you when we have an appropriate relationship. I want to, now the cursing, even like with the children, you punish a child, we'll call that a curse. Why? Hopefully to help them change, modify their behavior so that they can receive blessing. So essentially the curses are designed to bring blessing. If it wakes you up, changes your behavior, then blessing can come. Amen? Isn't that what it's about? And notice this is all about love. He's trying to tell you, if you love me, keep my commandments so I can express love to you and bless you. And in the blessings, by the way, when you read Deuteronomy 28, it becomes very clear that part of the blessings is safety. No one will make you afraid. Ten of you will chase away a thousand of them. All these kind of things. He says you will be safe. No one will make you afraid. So that's part of the blessings. And so they will bless you. Obedience will bless you, right? If we follow and obey, it will keep you safe. Now, since we know Yeshua is the full embodiment of obedience to the Father's commandments and instructions, we know that that's what it looks like to be him. And so if we do it, it transforms us into him. The more we imitate him, the more we're like him. So what does Torah do? Three things, right? It blesses you, it keeps you safe, it makes you him. It's, it's the vehicle that transforms you. And all of that is what? An expression of love. So what's love have to do with it? Everything. It has everything to do with it. And this is really important that we understand as we go forward with this that that's what love has to do with it. You know, in, verse, uh, in chapter 5, in verse 29, we'll just go back for a second to Deuteronomy. This is, this is where Yahweh's pleading is. Oh, that they had such a heart in them. Because what do we think of when we think of the word love? We think of the heart. Oh, that they had such a heart in them to fear me and to guard all my commands always. Why? So that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Oh, but the church has told you the commandments are bad. That you fall from grace if you try to keep Torah. That's what the way they'll interpret Galatians. Listen, if that's what Galatians is really saying, I've got a real problem with Galatians. And you should too. I don't think that's what it's saying. But if that is, Yahweh himself just said through Moshe, can we agree Moshe has a higher position than Shaul, than Paul? You know, Paul doesn't even get an apostle with a capital A. You understand what I'm saying? I don't want to hear everybody telling me there was no capitals in Greek. You understand what I'm saying? He wasn't one of the 12. Oh, but some, I've had people who don't pay attention to the book of Acts go, oh, but when Judas was dead, they replaced him with Paul. No, they replaced him with a Matityahu, another Matthias. They replaced, Paul's not the new 12th apostle. Okay? That doesn't make him not an apostle. Everybody that's sent out is called a shaliach, an apostle. The whole, all the 70, 120, they're all essentially apostles. But he's not one of the 12. He doesn't get a throne. He doesn't get to sit in judgment of the 12 tribes. He's not listed in that list. I am not offending Paul. He'd be offended if you thought otherwise, I believe. Okay? But let's understand, when you argue with your Christian friends, and they will love to go to places like Galatians, do what I do. Remind them, if Paul is saying what you believe he's saying, then he's a heretic and you need to throw him out. And after they look at you sideways and get all offended, and they say, well, you got two choices. Either he's saying what you're saying, and that, then throw him out. If he's not, then you have to realize that you don't understand what he's saying. Those are only two options you have. Okay? Because if he is saying what they're claiming from a Christian or a Paulian, you know, it's almost like Paulianity, right? The way they interpret Paul. Okay, from that thing, if they're interpreting it that way, well, that's in conflict with, Yahweh just said, oh, that they had such a heart in them to fear me, to guard all my commands always, so it might be well with them and their children forever. Forever. 
And then what do we have? An entire church founded about 2,000 years ago that doesn't have any heart in them to keep any commandments. They want it all done away with, say it was nailed to the cross, blah, blah, blah. That is not the heart that he's screaming out, oh, that they would have such a heart in them. But they didn't. He said, if they would only have a heart, what's the heart? Love. If they would only love me, if you love me, guard my commands. Please, if you love me, guard my commands, because they will bless you and keep you safe and change you into me. If you just embrace that, he's saying, then, he says, it would be well with you forever. How does anybody think they're going to have forever without that? All these people who think in Christianity that they're somehow going to spend forever and eternity with Messiah keeping nothing. And I don't blame them. They're only believing what they were told. Like you did. I mean, it's not their fault. That's what they're being told every Sunday from the microphone. Congratulations, you've got your golden ticket. You're going to go pick, a, pick out a cloud that looks comfortable and sit on with your harp. All right. But th that's, that's the key there. Oh, that they would have such a heart in them. But they don't. I mean, this is really important that we understand these things. Now let's go back to chapter 7. I said I would continue and add in the next section of it. So in verse 15, he says, And Yahweh shall turn away from you all the sickness and put on you none of the evil and the diseases of Mitzrayim, which you have, uh, Mitzrayim, which you have known, and he shall put them on all those who hate you, and you shall consume all the peoples. Wow, all this good stuff is going to happen. Verse 17, he goes, And when you say in your heart, These nations are greater than I, and unable to drive them out, he says, Don't be afraid. All of these things, he said, look, you're going to have your moments, your moments of weakness, your moments of fear, your moments of concern, and you're going to panic. And as, you're, and as you panic, he's saying, don't worry about that stuff. But you know what's going to happen? Let's go back to chapter 4. Let's go backwards here a second. He says, don't forget in verse... I know I keep reading other stuff and I gotta write these things down. You guys are gonna want this in the notes, right? Okay, chapter four, let's go to verse 24. For Yahweh your Elohim is a consuming fire, a jealous L. Now, we did cover this on Tuesday, just so you understand that jealousy is a human emotion. Yahweh doesn't have human emotions that way, but he's trying to help us understand through what we understand. So what does somebody jealous generally want? I want you all to myself. Well, he does want you all to himself. He just doesn't have that green eye of jealousy or whatever they used to talk about, you know, metaphorically, okay? He's, he knows what's best for you, and he wants you all to himself. He wants you to have him and him alone. He says, and when you bring forth children and grandchildren, grow old in the land, and shall do corruptly, and make carved images in form of whatever, and shall do what is evil in the eyes of Yahweh your Elohim to provoke him, they're standing there about to start. They haven't done anything yet already, he's telling them. And generationally, when you go forward, guess what's going to happen? You're going to do corruptly. Now, I love that he's using the word corruptly here, because what is corruption? It's taking something that is and corrupting it. In other words, destroying its look or its function or something about it so it is no longer what it began to be. Something that is designed to be A, and now you're using it for the wrong thing, and you're, you've changed it and altered it. You've corrupted its purpose, corrupted its function. Isn't that what they've done to his Torah? When you do corruptly, because other people read this and go, well, this is just talking about idolatry, about carved images. No, he says, look, when you do whatever is evil in Yahweh's sight, what is evil? We have the definition of evil. We've said it in lots of teachings. Taking anything that Yahweh has purposed and doing something else with it that he did not purpose, that goes against his purposes. That is what's evil, all right? And so here he's saying, look, you're going to do these things, and guess what it's going to do? Provoke him. 
not the way we think of it in human terms, but it's going to cause him to do to you what is necessary to wake you up and to show that you can't just do whatever you want without consequence. So you're going to force him, just like a parent might say to a child, why do you keep doing this? I don't want to punish you. I don't like doing these things to you, but you force me and give me no choice but having to do that. Okay, so let's understand what it means by, what he means when he says provoke. You have put him in a place where he has no choice but to respond. Okay, that's the provocation. And he says, I shall call the heavens and earth to witness against you on that day that you soon completely perish from the land which you pass over the ark and possess, and you do not prolong your days in it but are completely destroyed. In other words, you're going to be taken into captivity. He didn't say they'll be completely destroyed, like there will be none of you ever in existence. There's always a discussion of a remnant. As a matter of fact, he's going to talk about in a few more verses how they're going to be called back. But he said you're going to be taken completely off the land as being a people on the land. He says, and Yahweh shall scatter you among the peoples. And you shall be left few in number. See, there are going to still be some, that remnant. Few in number among the Gentiles where Yahweh drives you. And there you shall serve mighty ones, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, to neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there you shall seek Yahweh your Elohim and shall find when you search for him with all your heart and with all your being... So notice what's happening now. They went into this place that they needed to go to get a attitude adjustment. They had to need to get an attitude adjustment. And in that place, they woke up and they realized they needed to seek Yahweh with all their heart. And in your distress, when all these words shall come upon you in the latter days, so there'll be those that actually have read these words, known these words, and then they realize, wow, this is exactly what he said. And by the way, the curses should be encouraging to you just as much as the blessings and promises because if he said it and you earned it and he did it, that proves him truthful and reliable and trustworthy. In both sides. If he was to go ahead and wipe out the curses part that he promised you'd get, then he's not trustworthy. If he said, if you do this, you're going to get that, and you don't, then where's the trustworthiness? For good or bad, right? For blessing or cursing. He says, so when these words come back upon you in the latter days, latter days is referring to end times. So now we're talking about now, as we get closer to end times, the latter days. He says, then you shall return to Yahweh your Elohim and shall obey his voice. Oh, you're going to come back into covenant. Because it was not obeying his voice that got you scattered in the first place. So let's see, okay. Disobeying Torah, disobeying covenant, breaking covenant, not obeying his voice, caused us to be punished and scattered. So the solution is for the son to come, die, so that we don't have to obey his voice and we don't have to do any covenant and we can just be restored. This is insanity. That shows you how your brothers and sisters have been given delusion. It's not their fault. That is something Yahweh has done. He has not allowed them to see. Don't blame them. Don't judge them. But they're in a system that is perpetrating in them what you, when you came out, you said, how could I ever have believed this? This is nuts. It's crazy. Because the other verses, when he says, our fathers have inherited lies, we've been given strong delusion. That proves it true. When you talk to your father, your sister, your mother, your brother, your coworker, and they cannot see what you see, or if you remember when you couldn't see what you see, it proves it true. It's a strong delusion. It gives you confidence in your word that you have in front of you. Because you should know in 2020, in most well-educated countries, a reasonably educated, smart person, rational person, should be able to read this word and come to the same conclusion you now come to. But they can't because of the delusion. They cannot process correctly. Just like an autistic kid can't process correctly or an ODD person can't, whatever. When you have those psycho-emotional places where you cannot process things correctly, 
Okay? This is what we have. This is that problem. A delusion is simply the inability to process reality correctly. And the world is delusional, except for a small remnant that is beginning to wake up out of the, the dream, the sleep. And just realize it's not like an all-at-once thing. You don't just like wake up and now you see everything. You still have delusional pieces that you need to work on because they're emotionally still attached. And you got to be aware of that. And he says, look, you're going to come out of that place and you're going to obey his voice. For Yahweh, your Elohim, is compassionate. He doesn't forsake you nor destroy you nor forget the covenant of your fathers which he swore. That's the key. He's not going to forget the covenant. He's going to keep a remnant around to keep the covenant with. He's going to pop that delusion bubble on some people, let them wake up, and give them an opportunity to do what? To covenant and obey his voice. Very hard to do when Hasatan has created a church system that's designed to keep you from that understanding. Because their way of seeing things prevents you from obeying his voice. Because they tell you that's all been nailed to the cross, done away with. It's no good. If you try to keep the law, you've fallen from grace. Well, if you don't keep the law, you fall, keep the law, you've fallen from covenant. And without covenant, you cannot have favor from above. Go listen to the search for the doctrine of grace. Okay, favor comes from doing what's pleasing in someone's sight. That brings favor. You hear this many times in the scripture, like when you see Jacob going to Esau. Please don't kill me if I've done anything that has found favor in your sight. Don't kill me. There's verses like that over and over again. If I've done anything to please you, to find favor in your sight, and so that is earned. That's what a person says, I deserve through what I've done with you to have a moment of mercy here. Mercy is normally an undeserved thing but I'm asking for your mercy and compassion because I feel like I've done enough things in our life together to have earned that. Don't link this to salvation. Salvation is free. It's not earned. I know some of you are swimming upstream against that. Go listen to the teaching. Are you saved? Salvation has nothing to do, nothing to do with the reward except that you need it to have reward. In other words, salvation does not equal reward he died for everybody at once, period. Everybody that ever lived or ever will live. That made salvation possible for everybody. It's favor that brings reward. Because you've done something pleasing in my sight, I want to give you a gift. I want to give you a reward. And he tells you how to earn that reward. It's through obedience to his voice. It's not rocket science but it's challenging emotionally swimming upstream against all the other nonsense you've been sold for all these generations. If you love me, keep my commandments, guard my commandments, obey my voice, and I will give you the other side of it, blessing, protection, and transformation. It's really simple. But Hasatan has done a good job of making it complicated because we have that emotional context, okay? And so this is really what we need to understand as we add in, I guess where did I end there? Verse 31. So I'll just kind of put that in here. This is important stuff, okay? This is important stuff. You have to have this understanding if you're gonna understand what love is in all relationships, love between each other and love between him. Right now we're still focusing between our love between us and him. Okay? Some of you are thinking, well, where's the spirit in all of this? Well, how do you think I just remembered all these verses to tell you where to go that weren't in my notes? That's the ruach. That's the spirit. How are you going to bring to remembrance all the things that you're learning and that you need to understand? That's the ruach. That's the spirit. That's where the spirit is in all of this. The spirit is also the fullness of the intention. He doesn't just want you to mechanically guard and do 
He wants to do it how he fully intended it, with the O oh, that they would have such a heart approach. That they would take joy in obedience. Because what does it say? It is the Father's good pleasure to give Yeshua everything. Why? Because it was Yeshua's good pleasure to do everything the Father said. And you want all this stuff. You want eternity. You want all these other things. And it's his good pleasure to give it to you. If it's your good pleasure to give him what he wants. What does he want? He wants you to trust him. You know, we covered it real briefly, but I didn't really emphasize it with the, uh, with the uh, teaching on it. But when it talks about the fear, okay, when it says, oh, that they had such a heart in them to fear me. If you haven't figured that out, then you're not going to figure out anything. Go to the fear of Yahweh teaching. Nothing happens till you figure that out. At least it doesn't happen with the right heart. You might figure out the mechanics, you might start doing the right things, but until you learn to fear him, have a proper awe, respect, reverence, fear of disappointing and letting him down, because that's what he said, oh, that they should have such a heart in them, right? But back to 529, to fear me and guard all my commands always. See, if you don't fear him, you don't guard the commands. Because if you fear mom, dad, brother, so whoever you fear more will have more leverage and influence on how you obey. That's when you start to go a little sideways, left or right. Because now you're allowing an influencer to kind of push you in one direction or the other, and you're no longer walking straight. Who's influencing you more? You fear him properly, there's nobody. And that's when you can say with a genuine heart, with a, a, a proper respect to whoever it is that's going to be all mad at you when you say no to them and say, I know this is important to you. I want to be there too, but you chose to put this on Saturday. Some of you can even say, not all of you because you hadn't done it this way, but sometimes you can say, and I told you. That when grandma dies, because she was already sick and dying, that if you had the funeral on Saturday, I couldn't come. Or I told you when you were dating that boy or that girl that if you got married and had the wedding on Saturday, I wouldn't come. So don't look at me like I didn't tell you. I told you. And by the way, you should tell people if you know somebody is dying that they, and, that's, and that's coming up that, that you want to be at that funeral. I want to be there. Can you please not do this on Shabbat or a holy day? You're my daughter, you're my son, you're my grandchild, whatever. I want to be at your wedding. Please do it on a... They don't need to do it on Saturday. But you need it not to be. There's no reason they can't do it on a Monday or a Tuesday or a Sunday or any other day of the week. Because none of them keep Sunday like a Saturday anyway. There's no problem doing it on Sunday for all those Christians. Tell them. And then when they get all mad at you, say, well, didn't we already have this conversation? I told you it's your wedding. You could do what you want. But I also said if you do it this way, I'm not coming. I also told you I want to come. So why are you mad at me now? Well, I just figured, no, what do you figure? You don't see, they don't believe you when you give your word. Why? Because in your life, you've not been true to your word. That's your fault. If you'd been true to your word and you tell them, if you do this, I'm not coming, there should be no thought that if they do it, that you're coming. My family, which is not very observant, not really observant at all, my, my parents, etc., my brothers and stuff, but they've learned after years of me telling them, if you do this, we're not coming, that they now recognize that. Or if I have to point it out, there's never an argument because they'll say, oh, by the way, we're doing this and this. I said, and it's on Shabbat and I'm not coming. And they're like, oh, I forgot, or whatever. It's amazing. They're Jewish, and they forget these things, conveniently. Very disappointing. And often, they will try to move it so that they can do that, okay? My brother even tried to move his daughter's bat mitzvah. From, it was during Sukkot. And I said, I can't come. It's during Sukkot. Which is funny because their birthdays were in the summer, but that was the only available time that they could get the synagogue to, because I guess they had so many things that were going on, so they couldn't do it until like October. And I said, and he tried to move it, but he couldn't to change so that I could be there. I said, 
It's during Sukkot. I have Sukkot obligations. I can't fly up to New York for a bar mitzvah. Okay? And some of you are thinking, well, what's the difference between a bar mitzvah and a, and a wedding? All a bar mitzvah is is that the person who's being bar mitzvah or bar mitzvah runs the service that Shabbat. So it's still a Shabbat service. It's just instead of the cantor leading the service or the rabbi, the kid does it. Okay, so it's not the same as a wedding. It's not the same as a funeral. It's still a Shabbat service. It's just the difference is who's leading the service. Okay? And that's their opportunity to do that. Of course, then they have a big party afterwards. So I've gone to those before, and then I, I just don't go to the party. Okay, one of my, one of my cousin's you know, children had had a thing, and my wife and I went to the service, and then we waited till sundown to go to the party, even though they had it right after the service. Nothing wrong with going to a Shabbat service, though. So we did that part. So just so you understand, let your family members know, especially when you know something is coming. You know you have a child that's serious about somebody and they're planning to get married. Let them know, darling, I love you. You are my daughter. You are my son. I want to be at your wedding. I'm excited that you're about to get married, that you found that person that's special in your life but I want to come. Can you please, out of respect for me, do it on a day, not on Shabbat? See, now, if your relationship is right with them, they would probably do that. If you don't have that relationship, well, that's because you, for whatever reason, don't have that relationship. Now, that may or may not be your fault, okay? Some children are really just tough to do whatever kind of relationship with, but, you, you know, it depends on the effort you've made. I counsel this a lot recently, a lot of people with their children becoming teenagers and the very challenging thing about trying to earn that relationship with your teenager. And I'm telling you, you're going to have to swallow a lot of stuff, but you can do it. Because they're going to be wanting to do or wanting to tell you about stuff that you don't want to hear. But you need to, because they need you and you need them and you need to develop that relationship. And it needs to be where they trust you and they're going to talk to you. And guess what? You have that kind of relationship. When they go to get married and you say to them, you and I, we, we've been closer than close your whole life. I would really appreciate it if, so I can be there if you could do this for me. And you know what? They will. The only reason they don't is because you're not in that level of relationship with them. They've already told you to jump in a lake so many times. They don't care what, you know, making any you know, adjustments for you. But you got to start earning that when they're 13, 12, 13, 14, and you got to work on it. I'm not talking about coddling them. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about having a way where they can respect you and you're going to be tough with them, but they got to know where it's coming from. And they have to not be afraid. See, some of you have, most of you, if you have teenagers, you've got teenagers that are not telling you everything because they're afraid to tell you. I'm telling you right now. They're afraid to tell you. And so I don't care if you think you know everything. You probably don't. Because now, now how you'll know if they're not afraid to tell you and that you do know everything, when they start telling things that you know they would never tell you if they were afraid. Then you know you've got a relationship because they're not afraid to tell you that thing that they know would pop your cork. But then you better not pop your cork. You can still tell them you're not happy, but don't make it so that they're afraid to tell you. Because it won't change that they're doing it or not. But at least if you know, you have a chance to influence. And that's the important thing, that you have an opportunity to be counselor. You got to go from father and mother to counselor. Desired, trusted counselor. Respected counselor. Okay, and if you're going to flip out on them, they're not going to do it. And some of you are thinking, but I can't do that. Well, then you're not going to have that relationship. That's okay. That's your choice. Okay? But this is what we're dealing with. You have to still put him first. You can't bend to them. So I'm not telling you to allow or, or to be uh, supportive of stuff your children are doing that you don't agree with. Make it clear, I don't agree with this. But also make it clear that I'd rather know than not know. Does that make sense to anybody? Okay? Because you understand they're still doing it, whether you know or not. Wouldn't you rather know? If you know, you can hopefully have a, some, some sort of a, a voice they may consider listening to. 
But if they don't know, I mean, if you don't know as parents, then you can't have any influence. I've given some parents some very strange counsel. They've looked at me like I had four heads. Okay, I've had parents out there with children that were doing some things they really shouldn't have been doing, but they were sneaking out of the house. A lot of you go to sleep and you go to bed early. You have no idea what your children are doing sneaking out of the house. And don't you tell me, but you did it too. About 90% of you snuck out of a house when you were a kid. Don't tell me you didn't. And your children are looking at you like, you did that? Yeah, you did. Or you went to somebody else's house and you told your parents you were going to. Oh, yeah, if my parents call, just tell them I'm, I'm here, but I'm, I'm going over to whoever's house. I don't think your kids are doing any different. And I said, look, I would have a relationship with my kid that says, I'd rather know what you're doing, even though I don't like it, than have you sneak off, because then what if something happens to them and they went somewhere you didn't know and now they don't come back and you don't even know where to look? Don't, don't hint even that you approve, but just make it clear, I need to know. Look, my children know one thing. My job is to keep them safe. If I don't know, they're not safe, period, okay? But if they're afraid to tell me, I can't do that. So I got to listen to stuff maybe I don't want to hear sometimes. I'm not saying that I have or haven't, but I have to be open to that, right? And they need to know that they can tell me. You got to do that. Then when it comes to things like Shabbat, long way to get to that point again, if you have that level of relationship, do you think they just might not do it on Saturday? They might make an adjustment for you? You who were there for them in all their difficulties, all their challenges, who listened to them through all the stuff? Oh, yeah, I think they just might. Even if they're not in this walk, even if they're not doing what, they might make an adjustment for you. Just think about it. Now, some of you, it's too late. Your children are in their 30s and 40s and all of that, so you, you don't have quite that position but you know what? You could start to develop it. And if you could develop it, then when somebody, maybe, it's a, maybe they get a second marriage, maybe they get a divorce, and now they're going to have a new, a new life and a new marriage. And say, hey, now that we have this new relationship, could you consider doing it on a day I can come? I want to come. I want to be there. I want to be at grandma's funeral. I want to be at grandpa's funeral, or whoever it is. I want to be at your wedding. I like to be at a, a graduation. If the grad, now, you can't control the school system, but they could have maybe a little party on a Sunday instead that you can go to. They could help you by helping the child not think, grandpa doesn't love me, grandma doesn't love me because they didn't come to graduation. Help them understand that there's a reason and not to take it personally. Anyway, I hope that helps somebody, okay? Because this is all about expressing love, and it's got to start with our love for him. And once that's right, then we can express our love to each other correctly. And we're going to get there in another part or two when we get to starting on how we love our, our neighbors. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, we come before you. And Father, we really want to get this right, because we know that if we can't get this right, then nothing can be right. We have to learn how to have that heart to fear you, to guard all your commands so that it might be well with us. So that, Father, that we can truly express our love for you and have the door open then for you to fully express your love for us. Because if you were to express your love for us, Father, we understand that if you poured all that out on us without us doing our part, all you would be doing is being enabling and codependent with us in our foolishness. So we understand that, Father, that we have to keep our side of the covenant if we would have the heart in us to fear you and guard the commands. You would love and desire to give us all the blessing and safety and transformation that we could ever want. So Father, help us to truly wake up out of delusion in a fullness of awareness to see you truly as you are and to truly be able to then have the relationship you desire with us in covenant. And for those who have not uh, here listen to that. Please listen to the covenant teaching. Father, help them to receive and understand truly what it means to be in covenant with you. Father, we thank you. Father, we praise you and we appreciate that you are for us what I just described parents should be to their children, that you listen and observe us and watch us do every dumb thing that we do, but yet, Father, you're there for us to counsel us. You're there for us if we would ever just turn to you and seek you to give us the guidance that we need that you are always trustworthy, and we as parents need to be like you, always trustworthy to be there 
for our children. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you so much and praise you and ask that you in your mercy and your kindness that you would be patient with us as we strive in the direction of having that heart. And so, Father, we appreciate this so much as we come before you in the name of and the authority of following the example of your son, our Messiah, Yeshua. And it's in his name we pray. And together we say, Amen. Amen. Amen.